This video discusses brain proteins, A1C and glycination, and brain shrinkage. We actually change the shape of proteins in the brain when they bind to sugar, a process called glycation. Now, doctors can measure how much you're glycating your proteins with a very sophisticated test called A1C. And I'm kidding, it isn't sophisticated. It's a test that every doctor does in his or her office every day. It's used to measure average blood sugar in the diabetic patient. But it's a marker of this process called glycation, binding of sugar to protein, in this case to hemoglobin, but it has really profound implications because it's a marker of glycation going on in the brain, as a matter of fact. And it turns out that A1C, hemoglobin A1C, is the most powerful metric in terms of a laboratory study to predict annualized shrinkage of your brain. There's a perfect correlation between your blood level of A1C and the annual rate at which your brain shrinks. And size does matter when it comes to your brain. And the important thing about that study is that even at hemoglobin A1C levels of like 5.7 and 5.8, that most people will say, well, that's perfectly fine. Don't worry about it. That's the second highest level of annualized brain shrinkage. And it really plays upon the recent study I mentioned earlier in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, what was so important about that study is that even at blood sugars of 105 and 110, there was already significant risk for developing dementia. So it, it, all, it all relates. And you know, it even relates back to sleeping because the higher your carbohydrates in your diet, the higher your blood sugar, the more insulin will be produced, the more you'll produce fat, and more you'll have a risk for becoming obese. And that's a huge player when it comes to things like obstructive sleep disorders, compromising sleep. So, you know, what we're learning is when we started the program, all these bullet points that you mentioned, it turns out that everything here is powerfully interrelated. And to look for one specific leverage point, you know, ask us to vote for our favorite, I think what we've developed now is this notion that, you know, this is a very comprehensive, holistic approach uh, where all of these factors are intimately related. How does lifestyle affect patients who have got those neurodegenerative diseases? Well, I think one of the most important things for families and patients themselves is to try to maintain the best quality of life possible for the duration of that illness. And that's where lifestyle comes in. Just because you have Parkinson's disease doesn't mean you can't enjoy getting out and moving your body around. You're moving slower, maybe you're a little bit more clumsy, but there's actually something called Dancing with Parkinson's here in Toronto that shows very acute effects on the patient's movement. They start off in a chair, then they get behind the chair, leaning on the chair, and by the end of the hour, they are doing some kind of funky walk across the floor together. The benefits are interestingly measurable mm -hmm. by antipsychotic eye tracking. So we're hooked up, the brain is hooked up to the eyes, which is actually part of the brain, to track things. But what becomes a cognitive exercise is when I tell you not to look where the green dot is going, but look away. And it's very interesting that when we did an experiment before and after the dance class, we saw that patients with Parkinson's disease did better, more normally, on that anti-saccad mm -hmm. test. But interestingly, it also affects the patients in a positive way when they watch a video of the class together and are told not to move. Hmm. So there's evidence for something like Parkinson's disease. There's also evidence that patients who have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease have better activities of daily living and less depression when we get them to become physically active. And this is a very important point in clinic. We can sometimes write a prescription for more exercise. So hmm. talk to them about what they like to do, what they have done in the past that works for them, what current limitations may be, and then adapt to bring exercise into their lives. So there's this sense of bringing more oxygen and, and we can, David and I can arm wrestle about whether we want more glucose to get into the brain <laughs> uh, for these folks. But also, usually, as an older person, when you're doing physical activity, you're being brought into connection with other people. It becomes a social interaction. Yeah, I'd like to make a pitch for a, a, a modification, not a modification, but in addition to the language we use around exercise. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just that you move. I think there's a really big difference between being on a treadmill at the gym and watching TV and not paying attention to your body and moving with awareness, being really attentive 
to the quality of your movement, to the intricacy of the movement, to improving the quality of the movement. And here I'm talking in the Moshe Feldenkrais and Ad Baniel tradition, where you really help someone recreate a quality or create anew a quality of sophistication and movement that I think is really important in training the brain too. I think that applies to dancing, but it doesn't apply to mindless activities in the gym, which may be good for your brain because of oxygenation, but I don't think they optim optimally take advantage of what we can do with movement, which is some of the most amazing things that people are able to do. We're, we're cheating ourselves of having that mindful experience and the joy of how our bodies work. And so whenever possible, I will encourage people, whether they're in the gym or a dance class, to get a sense of what it's like to be in your body, to be present in this moment. That is a gift, to appreciate how your body can move while it still can, or if you're in a situation where you have Parkinsonism due to Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease itself, or immobilized because you have a bad knee now, what can you still do? And what can you do with the movement that you have? Become aware of how you take up space and how you transform yourself across that space and what it does to other people around you. These are the things that expand the repertoire of what your mind is doing. And we've had a lot of people ask, I'm sure everybody on this panel has been asked, so what's the one video game that you're going to press forward? It's not about getting really good at one thing. It's about expanding your repertoire. That's where cognitive reserve can be built.